Well, good morning. Good morning. Welcome, welcome, welcome everyone watching online. And um, this is the first official service of the year, right? So, Happy New Year. Well, I'm going to be as brief as I can be. Um, I'm going to start out and read something in Romans chapter 4, verse 24, and go from there. But it says, But also for us it shall be imputed to us who believe in him who raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered up because of our offenses and was raised because of our justification. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. So I was meditating on this scripture, um, this passage a couple of days ago. And as I was meditating on it, I was speaking out loud. And as I was reading Romans chapter 5, verse 1, I got to this part where it said, Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have, and just before I was getting ready to say peace, I heard the word insurmountable. And so as I heard this, I was like, wow, that's, that's pretty incredible. So I read it back to myself. I was like, we have been justified by faith. We have this insurmountable peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. So I wanted to look up the word, see what the definition actually read on it. And it says, too great to be overcome. It's pretty incredible. And uh, an ant or a, a synonym or similar word that I saw in there, it says unconquerable. You know, so we can we have that in our union with Christ and what he did for us. So we have this unconquerable peace within us always. And so as I was thinking about this, I began thinking about Jesus and how he was, you know, you know, the story, how he's in the boat with the disciples and the storm is raging and everything. And so, um, you know, we think about a lot of the time when he calmed the storm and the seas and everything. But I think the most important part really is how he's at rest in the boat. You know, I like Mark's account because it talks about he had a pillow. It says he went, he fell asleep in the stern of the boat on a pillow. It's the only one I think that says pillow. And to me, that I think that means comfort. He's at complete comfort and rest in this place of peace with the Father. And I believe he had that same, of course, he had that same insurmountable, unconquerable peace. And um, we know that he was, he had no plans really on stopping that storm. It was only because the disciples came to wake him up. So I like to kind of picture what it would have been like if Jesus had have stayed asleep in the boat. This is just my thought, but I just pictured the storm still raging. He's coming along in the boat comes up to the shore, the, maybe the bottom of the boat rubs it across the bottom. The boat's half filled with water, and all of a sudden he just wakes up. He's completely at peace, at comfort on his pillow. We all know what it's like to have a comfortable pillow. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so he just wakes up and goes, does what God tells him to do. So um, the important thing is we have the same thing in us each and every day. We have this unconquerable insurmountable peace with us and i think if we can grab a hold of this in our hearts just deep in our hearts i think we can actually do what romans chapter 8 verse 37 says for we we are more than conquerors through him who loved us you think about all the pressures and everything that try to come against us as we're god's calling us to do things in life and of course we're going to have pressure we're going to have resistance but if we can maintain this unconquerable just think about this unconquerable Nothing that the enemy, nothing, no, no darkness, no nothing that comes up against us can strike this thing down. If we can just grab a hold of this, you know. So you guys can go ahead and stand. I hope that resonates with you guys today. It's been uh, something that's sticking with me. So Father, we just bless you, Lord, and we just thank you, Lord, for this unconquerable, insurmountable peace that we have with you each and every day of our lives, Lord. And we thank you for what Jesus did for us. So we have this continual relationship, continual union with you each and every day. Lord, I pray that whoever needs to hear this today, Lord, that this would just resonate in their hearts so deep, Lord, that we would no longer be held bound. We no longer be held back from doing the things that you've called us to do, Lord. And I just bless you and I thank you for that. And Father, I thank you for just the word coming forth today, Lord. 
May it pierce our hearts. May it change us. May it. May we look a little bit more like Jesus today before we leave, as we leave today. And we just bless you and we thank you, Father, for it. And we thank you for the sweet worship here today, Lord. May we honor you with our lips. May we honor you from our heart, Lord. And we love you and we thank you. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. It's all for his glory, isn't it? You may be seated. All right, well, let's just go ahead and pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for today. Jesus, we give you all the praise. We give you all the glory. We give you all the honor that you would be magnified this morning. Holy Spirit, I pray you prepare every ear, prepare every heart to receive that which you want to speak. Holy Spirit, just move me out of the way and do what you want to do. Let only the words be spoken that you want spoken. Father, let every heart be ablaze, Lord, that as we walk out of this room, Father, I pray that they would be changed more into your image than when they first walked in. Lord, I just take authority right now over the atmosphere. Father, I pray, Lord, that if there be anything that is a hindrance, anything, Lord, that is a, a, a contaminant, Father, we just speak the blood of Jesus right now. Lord, to just purify the very atmosphere, Lord, that that faith would be easy, that believing would be easy. Holy Spirit, it's your anointing that breaks the yoke. So, Holy Spirit, let your anointing shoot forth like arrows into every household, into every life situation, into every heart, and that this morning, Lord, we'd be formed and fashioned like you. We give you the praise. We'll be careful to give you all the glory and all the honor in Jesus name. Amen. 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 Well, uh, it's good to see everybody. Checking, checking my time. All right. So last week, Pastor, he talked about uh, building life together and he kind of gave us the theme for 2023. And he talked about for the theme, again, is building life together, but that we really need to make sure we're running after eternal life. And remember when he talked about eternal life, that is not what's interesting about the Greek. It doesn't refer to duration. It refers to its origin. And what that means is it's the life that's fashioned after God. But he said in the theme, he said it's a year for the better or a year for the worse that as he was getting something that it seemed that there was something on the horizon in 2024 that as a church, as a body of Christ that we need to get ready for. Uh, he said the Lord spoke to him and said, you'll see more turbulence in 2024 than you've seen before. Greater upheavals of agitation, greater upheavals of unrest, unsettled uncertainty, and people will not be prepared for what is coming if they don't um, get a hold of eternal life. He said, those that are ready and have prepared themselves are watching and listening to the Lord. It'll be a year of greater increase than they've ever had before. That's a wonderful promise, isn't it? He said, the power of God is going to become so present that things will happen suddenly. Prayers will be answered quicker than in the past and acceleration of things are going to begin in the earth. And so that's kind of what he pastor gave last week about what we've stepped into. And I know what he shared last week, eternal life. It was exciting. It was exhilarating. Just the potential how I click, because I was excited, but as I was standing back there yesterday as he was closing, uh, I could feel the soberness of what he was saying. And I, I felt in my spirit that people weren't prepared for what's coming. And, you know, it, it burdens your heart to know that things could be coming because the Bible talks about a great falling away. The Bible talks about in the last days, people are going to be offended because of what's happening in the earth. And so as I was seeking the Lord this week, and we're going to see how the Holy Ghost wants to get this out. Uh, I want to help prepare you. I want to help give you a key to prepare you for what the Lord wants to do, because this can be a great year or this could be a terrible year. And I, and I believe that it's not hanging on the hinges of what God wants to do. It's hanging on the hinges of how we prepare for what God wants to do. 
And we want to make sure this is your best year yet. Amen. Amen. Are you excited? Yes. Yes. All right. We'll turn to first Kings chapter 18. We're going to get there in a second. Glory to God. I want to start us off with a little bit of a, where we are prophetically. As we know, Paul in his time said, we're in the last days. Well, if Paul said we're in the last days, then you know we're in the last of the last days. I mean, we're right at the edge of this thing. Pastor, remember he preached in one of his messages on the return of the Lord, how 2030 could be a potential date. Now, we're not putting that as a disclaimer, 2030, the Lord's coming back. But based on certain calculations, it shows you how close we could be. That's that's six years. Six years we could have left on this earth before the Lord comes back. It's sobering, isn't it? Because we want to make sure we, we hit the mark. We want to make sure when we get to heaven, he says, well done, thy good and faithful servant. But on the, the prophetic timeline is before the Lord comes, it's actually in Ephesians. You can stay in First King. You don't have to turn there. But in Ephesians chapter 5, Paul is mentioning the relationship between a husband and wife. And he says, uh, wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, and Christ is the head of the church, and he is the Savior of the body. Therefore, just as the church is subject to Christ, so let the wives be subject to their husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her. And here's the verse. That he may sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word, that he may present her to himself a glorious church, not having spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she should be holy and without blemish. So we know this is going to happen. It's his word. There's going to be a glorious church. There's going to be a church without spot, without wrinkle, with, with, that is living a holy lifestyle. The only question is, are you going to be part of that church or not? This is, this is no longer an option. We've passed a threshold on the prophetic timeline of God. It's called uh, the line of separation. Whether we're going to venture into this place where it's all in for Jesus or we're going to venture out into a place where it's none of Jesus. I promise you this. We're getting to the days where it's either you're going to be all or none. There is no more lukewarmness. There's going to be no more half in and half out. There's going to be no more halted between two opinions. It's not going to be I'm living for the world and I'm living for Jesus. It's going to divide to where it's either going to be all for him or none for him. And we've already started heading down this slope. An Olympic athlete doesn't prepare a week in advance before his big Olympic show date, does he? No, they prepare years in advance. Years in advance. They're disciplining their body. They're beginning to exercise themselves. They're building themselves up because they know there's a day coming where I'm going to have to perform at peak performance. And it's going to take time for me to get to that place and ready. And so we have to realize whenever the Lord comes back, we have to make sure we're ready. And we have to make sure we're doing the things to be a part of that church. Because there's going to be a press that Melody even talked about that's going to squeeze the church into her finest hour. And we got to make sure we're ready for that press. He, uh, I think it's in First Peter, says judgment begins in the house of God. There's a lot of stuff in this world that needs to be judged. <laughs> There's a lot of judgment and wrath that's going to fall on the world because of the immorality, because of the laws, because of the things that are going on. But before he, God judges the world, he's going to judge his own. You know, I'm not going to go over there and, and discipline your kid if I'm not disciplining my kid. I have to take care of my house first. The Lord's going to take care of his house first. And so we want to make sure we are prepared. Amen. So first Kings chapter 18. Are you ready? Yes. All right. Here we go. We're going to go through chapter 18 and we're going to break it down for you because there's some things in here that uh, we're going to get to. The, I don't really have a title. I call it um, personal revival. Uh, we can't go to corporate revival until you have personal revival. And before you have a corporate move of God, you got to have a personal move of God. Glory to God. A, a verse chapter 18, it says, and it came to pass. Let me give you a little bit of background real quick. So there's this dude named Ahab 
and he's not a good guy. As you pretty much know, he has a wife named Jezebel. She's full of the devil. Um, she is literally like the witchcraft personified in the flesh. Um, she is ruining Israel. She brings in Baal, worshiped Baal. Baal, uh, they believed he was the God that provided rain. He was the God that provided what they supplied and their sacrifice, just to give you kind of what their sacrifice in order to please Baal is sexual immorality, where they have just this whole heap of wickedness that is what they believe causes Baal to be happy to send forth the rain so that everything they can prosper. So this is what's happening in Israel. So there's this prophet named Elijah who says, um, basically that it's not going to rain until i tell it to rain that this is the word of the lord so there's no dew on the ground there's no rain for three years three can you imagine in savannah georgia three years without rain you're going to be coughing dust everywhere you go because it's completely dry i mean it's it's over three years no rain so we step into this scene in chapter 18. It says, And it came to pass that after many days, the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go present yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. So Elijah went to present himself to Ahab, and there was a severe famine in Samaria. And Ahab had Obadiah, who was in charge of his house. Now Obadiah feared the Lord greatly. And so it was while Jez uh, Jezebel massacred the prophets of the Lord that Obadiah had taken 100 prophets and hidden them 50 to a cave and fed them with milk, I mean bread and water. And Ahab had said to Obadiah, go into the land to all the springs of water and to the brooks. Perhaps we may find grass to feed the horses and mules uh, to keep them alive so that we will not have to kill any livestock. So they divided the land between them to explore it. Ahab went one way himself and Obadiah went another way to himself. Hold on. We're almost there. Now Obadiah was on his way and suddenly... Everybody say suddenly. suddenly. Elijah met him and he recognized him and fell on his face and said, Is that you, my Lord, Elijah? And he answered him, It is I. Go tell your master, Elijah is here. And so he said, Obadiah, how have I sinned that you are delivering your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me? Do you think he was happy to see Elijah? <laughs> he probably was happy, but he didn't like his word. As the Lord your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my master has not sent someone to hunt for you. And when they said he is not here, he took an oath from the kingdom or nation that they could not find you. And now you say, go tell your master Elijah is here. And it shall come to pass as soon as I am gone from you, that the spirit of the Lord will carry you to a place I do not know. So when I go and tell Ahab and he cannot find you, he will kill me. But I, your servant, have feared the Lord from my youth. Was it not reported to my Lord what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of the Lord, how I hid a hundred men of the Lord's prophets, 50 to a cave and fed them with bread and milk? And you now say, go tell your master, Elijah is here. He'll kill me. I mean, Obadiah is not very happy by this word. I think that's amazing that it says, as soon as I leave, the spirit of the Lord is going to take you somewhere where we have no clue where you're at. Yeah. Verse uh, 15, then Elijah said, as the Lord of hosts lives before whom I stand, I will surely present myself to him today. So Obadiah went to Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. And it happened when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, Is that you, O troubler of Israel? And listen to what Elijah says. He answered, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, in that you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord and have followed Baals. Now, therefore, send and gather all Israel to me on Mount Carmel, the 450 prophets of Baal and the 400 prophets of Asherah who eat at Jezebel's table. So I want to stop there just for a second to give that kind of introduces us where we're at. Israel is not in a good place. Israel is not serving the Lord. 
They are so consumed with Baal and Jezebel. And Obadiah is hiding prophets because Jezebel has been killing all the prophets of the Lord and, and introducing her own prophets. And so we have this moment where, again, it hasn't rained for three years. And Elijah says, we're going to go to the Mount Carmel. Carmel means fruitful. It means plenty. It really means garden. He's bringing them back to a place where there's going to be fruit, where there's going to be a garden, where there's going to be a release. It's no coincidence they go to the top of this mountain. But one thing he says here, he says, oh, troubler of Israel. He's like, I haven't troubled Israel. He's troubled the kingdom of darkness. And so I want to talk to you this morning about personal revival. I just made the connection this morning, Miss Lehman. Because I remember when I was 18, 16, 17, you know, I, I, I gave my life to Jesus. I... I remember having scriptures in my pocket, talking to people about Jesus. But as far as there being a fire, as far as there being this overwhelming passion, as far as there being this deep pursuit, it really, I, I mentioned before, it happened when I was 19 in the summer. It just something shifted. And I never knew it shifted. I just thought, you know, uh, you know, okay, well, maybe he did something. I didn't know it. And now, you know, here I am. I'm hungry. I'm pursuing. But I remember now that in April 2013, I got filled with the Holy Ghost. And then I went through that summer, May, June, July, and then August, it was like something, during that summer process, something shifted. It was progressive. It wasn't just this one super Holy Ghost, because I'll, I'll be honest with you, you know, we hear stories in the old days about the baptism of the Holy Ghost and how they had to tarry. They didn't receive it by faith. They just waited and waited and waited and pressed and pressed until God, by His mercy, baptized them in the Holy Ghost. And they had some pretty powerful baptisms. I didn't feel a thing. I didn't feel an absolute dime of a thing. Pastor Terry, I don't know if any of you remember Pastor Terry from middle Georgia, he said, what do you hear in your spirit? Well, all I kept hearing was Kotobasitaya. And I was like, I'm not saying that. I ain't got no rivers. Miss Perlene talking about rivers and, and floods and people over there shaking. And my mom looks like she's about to call down fire from heaven over there in tongues. And I'm over here. I don't feel anything. And I have this one word that it don't sound right. So I start saying it and saying it. And I prayed in tongues here and there, but I didn't pray much because, again, tongues is attached to faith. And if you're doubting that's your language, then you're going to doubt the power that's in that language. And so, therefore, I wouldn't pray as much because your mouth gets dry. You know how many times I had to say kotobasitaya in a row just to try to feel a little trink trinkle of something? And it's like, is that my emotion? Is that the Holy Ghost? Again, it's not based on feelings. You base it on the, the, the truth of Scripture. It's not a feeling. It's the truth of Scripture that if you pray in the Spirit, you're building yourself up in your most holy faith. But I didn't realize until this morning that the whole process of that summer, that something shifted and it started with the baptism of the Spirit. Because when I got back to school during that time, something began to fascinate me. It was called revival. And I began to study these men of God. I began to study these moves of God. It was like I was infatuated with it. I no longer wanted to do what I was doing. I wasn't doing anything sinful, but uh, where they had a saying where a ball was, Sam was. I mean, it didn't matter what it was, ping pong, tennis, I don't care, football, basketball, so even soccer. You know, no offense, Miss Michelle. Um, that, uh, uh, I, would, I would be there. I would play it. But something shifted. There was a burning begin to take place. And I, I'm telling you this, since April of 2013, that burning hasn't stopped. There's been times where it's waned a little bit. There's times where it's been stronger, but it hasn't ever given out. And some of those men that I began to, I want to give you some stories this morning. And as we keep going through this, Pastor, he talked about John G. Lake. Anybody ever heard of John G. Lake? I don't know if you know this, but John G. Lake was a millionaire and he sold everything he had to move to South Africa in order to, to, he said this, he was seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And he said, Lord, if you baptize me with your spirit, nothing will keep me from 100 fold obedience. Nothing will keep me from 100 fold obedience if you give me your spirit. So they had a group of men who would begin to pray. They would preach, but then they would pray for the baptism of the Holy Spirit. 
And he goes and gets a call. There's a lady who's been in a wheelchair for 10 years and they go to her house to go pray for her. And he sits in this low chair. And as he's sitting there, the other minister friends talking to her, getting her ready to pray for her. And he said it was like waves of glory begin to come over him. And he sunk down in this deep chair and he began to shake violently. He said that it was if the chair wasn't so low, he would have fell out the chair onto the floor. He said all he could say was like tropical rains of heaven weren't coming upon him. They were shooting through him. And he was in this moment being changed by God. He couldn't barely walk. The guy tells him to come over and says, come pray. Let's pray for her. He said the moment he touched her, he said he felt power shoot out of his body. And even though she didn't say anything, he knew she felt it. And he said the moment that they touched hands, he touched that woman's hand. He said it was like a torrent of electricity flowed out of his body so strong that it went into her body. And she was holding the hand of the other minister that it went through her body and knocked his friend onto the ground. And his friend sits up and says, my John, I believe you've been baptized in the Holy Ghost. But he started it with a hunger and a pursuit. He had such a hunger and a desire, a pursuit to be filled with the power of the Holy Spirit that the Lord answered him in a mighty way. And from that point on, I'm telling you, from that point on, he said giftings, miracles, healings began to break out. When he finally retired, he went to, I think it was, uh, it was in Washington. I don't remember the name, but they set up a healing school. It was verified by the United States that the city, I think it was, uh, I have it on my phone, I don't remember, Spoke, anybody remember the name? Spokane, yeah, that's what it was. Spokane, Kansas, uh, Washington. Yep, that's it. Spokane. Uh, Spokane, Washington, that it was literally the healthiest city in America for five years. They had the terminal... Uh, giving them into the health care. Just, all right, we can't do anything, they're gonna die. They would pray, 100,000 100, people would be just miraculously healed, even off their deathbed. To where the whole city was, were, the doctors were mad at John G. Lake because they were losing money because there was no patience to cure. Welcome to normal Christianity. That's normal. What we see in America today is not normal. That's normal. It just takes a person with a pursuit. Amen. Speak as we, before we read, speaking of John G. Lake, we know we talked about the bubonic plague story. That's amazing. But there was another story where they had a man who had a deteriorating bone. His bone was literally just deteriorating. And they wanted to inspect him, right? You're having all these miracle cases, all these healing cases. You want to see, is he actually, what's he doing? Is something's going on? So they brought him to a doctor's office and they inspected him. The bone was underneath an x-ray machine. He puts his hand on the bone underneath the x-ray machine, okay? The bone's deteriorated. On the x-ray machine, when he begins to pray, you can literally, the doctors are watching it, the deteriorated bone begins to form back into wholeness right in front of their eyes. So my question is this, James 5 says, Elijah, as we're reading about him, the one who troubled Israel, the one who shut up the heavens, says he was a, like, it was a man just like us. There was nothing different about him. Moses, nothing different. Elijah, nothing different. Deborah, nothing different. Ruth, Naomi, nothing different. Samuel, David, nothing different. They had their ups, they had their downs, but they were human. They're not super heroes, aliens who we can't attain to. They were flesh like us. But it was their pursuit that made them different. God will give you as much as you want. If you're willing. Amen. All right, let's keep going. Verse 20, so Ahab sent all the children of Israel and gathered the prophets together at Mount Carmel. And Elijah came to all the people and he said, how long will you falter between two opinions? If the Lord is God, follow him. But if Baal, follow him. But the people didn't answer him a word. This is the same call that's going out today. How long are we going to falter, falter between two opinions? See, church is not just supposed to be a weekly meeting. 
This isn't just supposed to be a, a, a fun experience or a, where you get an encounter with the Lord and then you just go back to the week as normal. There's a, a book that I received as a gift a while back. It's called The Fire That Never Sleeps. And in the very first chapter, they say this, you don't need a new spiritual experience. Now, we know there are markers in the spirit where you have an encounter with the Lord. It changes you and you can look back on them. He said, you don't need a new spiritual experience. We need to learn how to steward what has already been provided. You don't need a new Holy Ghost. We have the same Holy Ghost that baptized John G. Lake. You have the same Holy Spirit that baptized Jesus on the River Jordan. He's not any different. The same Spirit that raised Christ from the dead dwells in you. Yes. We don't need anything new. We need to go back and find what they found to steward what we have already been given. You have 100% capacity of eternal life dwelling in your spirit, man. Your spirit can do exactly everything Jesus did. But because he was completely surrendered to the Lord, because he was completely dead to self and alive unto the Father's plan, and his mind was completely in sync his soul was in sync with the word of God. There was a, what we call it, a just effortless flow. It's like a, if you turn the faucet on at home, uh, the water hose outside, there's a complete flow. There's nothing lacking. It's at 100%. But that doesn't mean you're getting 100% out of the hose. Why? Because you could have a kink in the hose. You could have a twist in the hose where even though it's powerfully coming in, it's not powerfully flowing out. And so what the renewing of the mind is, it's unkinking some of those things that have tripped us up, those experiences, those hurts, those offense, those wounds, those distractions. And we begin to unwind those things. And as you unwind it, the flow begins to come greater and greater. Amen? Amen. Let's keep reading. So he says this, they didn't answer a word. And again, that's the whole line of separation. There's coming a time you got to pick. You got to pick and choose. Are you going to be on fire for Jesus, or you're going to you're going to fire? And listen, if you don't start becoming on fire for Jesus, the world would pull out your fire. That's the times we're living in. If you won't become on fire for Him fully, the world's going to try to put your fire out. Verse twenty. Two. Then Elijah said to the people, I alone am left a prophet of the Lord, but Baal's prophets are 450. Therefore, let them give us two bulls and let them choose one bull for themselves, cut it into pieces, lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. And I will prepare the other bull and lay it on the wood, but put no fire under it. Then you shall call on the name of your gods, and I will call on the name of the Lord. And the God who answers by fire, everybody say fire. fire. He is God. So all the people, people answered and said, it is well spoken. Now Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, choose one bull for yourselves, prepare it first, for you are many, and call on the name of your God, and put no fire under it. So they took the bull which was given them, and they prepared it and called on the name of Baal from morning even until noon, saying, O Baal, hear us. But there was no voice. No one answered. They leaped about the altar which they had made. And so it was at noon that Elijah mocked them, saying, Cry aloud, for he is a God. Either he is meditating, or he is busy, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he is sleeping and must be awakened. So they cried aloud and cut themselves, as was their custom, with knives and lances, and until the blood gushed out on them. And when midday was passed, they prophesied unto the time of the offering of the evening, evening sacrifice, but there was no voice. No one answered. No one paid attention. If you look at this, because what we're going to begin to talk to you about is building an altar in your life. That's your key. Build your altar. As I was reminded this week, as I was preparing for this message, looking at these men, reading these stories of these men, John G. Lake, Smith Wigglesworth, Father Seymour, uh, Mary Woodward Etter, uh, Catherine Coleman. I mean, you can name these greats. There was something distinct about their life. It was like, it's almost like they tasted a, a touch of heaven that the people around them didn't taste. 
And again, it wasn't because they are special. It's because they were separated and consecrated and holy. But if you look at the prophets of Baal, everything they're doing symbolizes the works of the flesh. They're not separated. They're not consecrated. They're not holy. So it's like them trying to come and perform the service, coming to church without even having that place of separation, trying to muster in their own strength God to move. It doesn't work that way. Entertainment will never set the church ablaze. I don't care how many lights, how many smoke machines, the, the celebrity Christianity who you get come to preach. God, uh, there was a minister who said this, God never puts revival on discount. Leonard Ravenhill wrote a book called Why Revival Tarries, and he said this, No man is greater than his prayer life. No man is greater than his prayer life. He said the pastor that is not praying is playing. The people who are not praying are straying. The pulpit may be able to display a shop window to man's talents, but the prayer closet holds no such thing. It is man before God completely bare. So we see a lot of this in America where people are coming and doing church and performing church. And, but what's the least attended meeting? It's prayer. What does hell fight you over the most? Prayer. What is your strength? Prayer. And so... Let's read. Let's read. We'll get there. Let's read. We're in verse. Thank you. Then Elijah said, all the people come near to me. So all the people came near to him. Listen, this is it right here. What did he do? And he repaired the altar of the Lord that was broken down. Israel's altar was broken. That's significant. When Noah got off the, the ark, he made an altar. Abraham made an altar when he had an encounter with the Lord. And then when he went to sacrifice Isaac, Jacob had an encounter with the Lord. He made an altar. What does an altar symbolize? One, it's a memorial that the Lord met me here. Two, it signifies separation. It signifies a sacrifice. Israel lost their consecration. They lost their separation. They lost their memorial of what God had done. Their altar was broken. And my question to you this morning is, what state is your altar in? Because it's no longer a natural altar that we have to actually make. It's the spiritual altar of your life. It's called the secret place that you go before the Lord. Is there dust upon your altar? Has the fire gone out? The first thing Elijah did and the first thing we have to do this year is rebuild the altar of our lives. 31. And Elijah took 12 stones according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob to whom the word of the Lord came saying, Israel shall be called your name. Yeah. So I like it down here. It's nice. <laughs> Thank you. So what did he do? Number one, he started to rebuild the altar. And then what did he take? He took 12 stones to represent the 12 tribes of Israel. What are those 12 tribes symbolizing? God's covenant. He's taking God's covenant. He's taking God's covenant. This is not just an ordinary book. This is not just a, I'll read it in the morning. I'll go through my Psalms. The scripture says, this is life. This is bread. He said in his word that when it came to the church, he's going to wash her by the water of the word. I see it. I see it in America. This is optional. Since when? Listen, listen. This is scripture, right? But now this is seen as if I like it, I'll accept it. But scripture has lost its ability, listen, to say what is right and what is wrong in my life. 
This is the authority that says the way you're living is right or the way you're living is wrong. Not society, not celebrity preachers, not your feelings. This says whether you're right or wrong in living. This says that sexual immorality and pornography, you cannot inherit the kingdom of heaven. That if you're addicted to those type of things, the kingdom of heaven can't operate through your life to the capacity that he wants. He'll be faithful here and there. I remember my times where I was addicted to that stuff. One morning I woke up for church after having a, a relapse and he used me in a prophetic gift. And I cried. I didn't want him to. I realized he had, did not care in that moment about my character. He only cared about meeting that person's need. He just needed a vessel. And that's scary because he can use an impure, impure vessel for his purpose. But that does not mean you please him. That does not mean you know him. That's what happens when people in Matthew chapter 7 say, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons, heal the sick, and prophesy in your name? And he says, I never knew you. Depart from me, you who live in lawlessness. You who live habitually sinful lives thinking it's okay because your actions and your works and the anointing on your life in a meeting is going to fill the void. No. Because he said in 2 Corinthians, come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. Now, if you're dealing with that stuff, the Lord has freedom. The Lord has freedom. But don't, and it doesn't matter what it is. It could be drugs. It could be alcohol. It could be offense. It could be unforgiveness. It could be bitterness. It could be jealousy. It could be gossip. It could be slander. You know, the, the scripture says in Proverbs, where there's no wood, the fire goes out. You want to know what that means? In that context, where there's no gossip, the conversation ends. Where there's no talking behind people's back, it's over. Where there's no secret judgments. When we judge others, we're heaping up eternal judgment of ourselves. Because that means He's going to look at our life. For everything we judge them for, He's going to begin to look at our life in judgment. Mm -hmm. Did you know one of His abominations is discord among the brethren? Samadrina, did you see? Psst, psst, psst. Discord, he, it's an abomination. He hates it. And we wonder why there's no glory in the church. We wonder, listen, I've heard stories of before people could even step foot in a building, they were on their face, weeping, crawling to get in the building because the glory of God was habitually abiding in that place. When's the last time we walked through the door and the presence of God hit us so strong on the way in? And if it is not doing that, it's because prayer is lacking and the altar is cold. There's no fire on the altar. My aim today is to get us back to biblical Christianity. Listen, instead of Elijah, oh, you who trouble Israel. When you start living fully for Jesus, you're going to lose friends. All you young people, you're going to lose friends. People are going to look at you weird. People are going to say stuff about you. You're going to, family members are going to turn your back on you. People won't understand your commitment, your consecration, your dedication to the Lord. But we're, we're missionaries on this earth. When I went to Liberia back in 2016, I wasn't looking around looking for their approval to accept me. That's not my home. You love them. You, you spread the word. I remember at night, it's kind of funny, the two boys would come. They had to get their test. I would do math work on the chalkboard. By the end of the two weeks, there was like six or seven of them that would all come up with their packets saying, can we do this question, that question, that question. But my life isn't to live for their approval. Because Jesus said this, he never committed himself to man because he knew man's hearts. Because they would... Praise him in one moment, they would curse him in the next. It was manifested when he wrote in them saying, Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. And then the next day, crucify, crucify, crucify. We live for an audience of one. Your life, your life is so that one day you'll get well done, thy good and faithful servant. And if something is trying to hinder 
your consecration and separation and love for Jesus, it's not worth it. I don't care how much money it offers. I don't care how far it'll take you. I don't care what kind of natural kingdom. Listen, God wants to bless people because he needs financial, godly financiers. He said in the last days in a prophecy, the wealth of the wicked will be laid up for the righteous, for the just. So we know God's going to turn some things around. And it's, excuse me, it's okay to have money. It's not okay for money to have you to where you lose your fire where you lose your dedication. Amen? Amen. All right, let's keep reading. So uh, Elijah, he rebuilds the altar. Number two, he reminds himself of God's covenant. He takes the 12 stones and he begins to build this altar before the Lord. In verse 32, when the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord and he made a trench around the altar large enough to hold two seahs of seed about probably three to four gallons and he put wood in order listen to that everywhere in scripture if you go to you can go to leviticus every time they put wood on the altar it was never just thrown on there see your altar you don't just show up you don't just, all right, let me give, I'm running late. Let me give God five minutes real quick. And you just throw out all these declarations, confessions, prayers. He said he carefully put the word wood in order. He's being careful with how he's laying out the wood. He's being careful how he's building this altar. He's being careful how he's coming unto the Lord. The Bible says through pray, we enter in his courts with uh, thanksgiving, enter his gates with praise. Or it might have been backwards. I think gates with pray, thanksgiving and courts with praise. He's careful. Every time you see it, go read the book of Leviticus. When they put the wood on the altar, it's, what is that symbolizing? Jesus said this, no one builds a house lest he first does what? Counts the cost. This is a time where your altar is built. You're remembering the covenant of God. And now you're placing the wood upon the altar. You're counting the cost because a sacrifice is about to be given. You're counting the cost. Is Jesus worth it? I said, is Jesus worth the cost? I believe he is. Now, I believe that for myself. But my revelation isn't your revelation. I tell my kids at school, what would you do? I mean, cause it makes me laugh because Alina says, uh, her dad used to do that. He'd say, what would you do if somebody came in with a gun and was about to shoot you? Would you deny him? So I'm only six, dad. What are you talking about? <laughs> So I tell my kids, what would you do if somebody, you know, we're living in a time where what if Christianity became to throw you in jail or put you to death for your faith? I said, it doesn't matter to me to live as Christ and to die as gain. You know, there's a story, there's two stories. Let me be quick because there was a man who he went, uh, I don't remember where it was, somewhere in, I think, Russia. And there was a couple priests. One of them was in a wheelchair and these soldiers came in and told them, deny Jesus. They just came in. What are they coming in just to cause you to falter in your faith? Deny Jesus. And they say, if you won't deny him, we'll light him on fire. And so they douse the man in the wheelchair in gasoline. And the priests are looking at each other and they look at him and he looks back at his pr priest friends. He says, let me burn. Let me burn. I'm not denying him. Let me burn. And they lit him on fire and they killed the other priests. But that's all they can do to you. He said, why would you fear those who can only kill the body? Fear him who can not only kill the body, but the soul. We got to live with the mindset there's eternity at stake. There's eternity. Your life is the dressing room for eternity. This isn't the showcase. This isn't the big wedding. This is just the dressing room before we step through the gate into the grand symphony of the, the marriage of the Lamb. Are you being dressed properly? Do you have stains on your garments? Are there spots in your love feast, as the scripture says? But listen, perfection is not the aim. It's pursuit. Because you're never going to be perfect 
because we still have an unrenewed body. He's not looking for your perfection. He's looking for your pursuit. David, was David perfect? No, but how come his heart was a man after God's own heart? All through scripture, it doesn't talk about how he slept with a woman and then killed her husband. No, it says he was a man after God's own heart. Go read the Psalms. There's times where he's like, Lord, where are you? Where's your presence? And then the next chapter, I will thank the Lord. I will praise him in his courts, no matter what I'm going through. I, in his prayers of repentance, create in me a clean heart, renew in me a right spirit, purge me of secret sins, wash me with hiss hyssop and I'll be white as snow. Let the meditation of my lips and the meditation of my heart be acceptable in your sight. I mean, these are things, this is your altar. This is your place where you begin to create a habitation with God. This is not success. These instruments are not success. Knowing Him is success. Knowing Him intimately and personally and experientially. And listen, it's hard at first. Your mind's going to wander. Your body's going to get up. But you got to stay the course to find Him. Because you want to know what the promise is, is if you know Him? This is life eternal. That they may know Him. You want more of that eternal life where sickness can't even touch you and the COVID touches your skin and it dies? That I might know Him. Let's keep going. All right, I'm doing good. And He put the wood in order, verse 33, and laid it. He said, fill four water pots with water and pour it on the burnt sacrifice on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And then they did it a second time and do it a third time. And they did it a third time. So water ran all around the altar and it filled the trench also. What's the sacrifice? So we have these stones, this altar, right? Which is, it's symbolic of the, the burnt offering in Leviticus. And let me just read you something out of Leviticus real quick. Anybody love Leviticus? I love Leviticus. Leviticus 6.13 because this, this is what's coming. A fire, everybody say fire. fire, shall always, everybody say always, always, be burning on the altar. A fire shall always be burning on the altar. It shall never go out. What makes the fire go out? Where there's no wood, there's no fire, but there's no sacrifice. They put a bull on, the, on this fire. Your altar of your life, you're the sacrifice. What does it say in Romans? That I might, I beseech you therefore, brothers, by the mercies of God, to present your body as a living sacrifice. You're the sacrifice for the fire to consume. What does that mean? What is a sacrifice? A sacrifice is dead. You want to know the three keys to personal revival? Die to self, the scriptures, prayer. It's simple. We don't see what we see in the old, in the old timers because we're still living too much for ourselves instead of living for the Lord. I think it was either David Wilkerson or Leonard Ravenhill said this, the world finds joy in entertainment, but the praying man finds joy in God. Yeah. David Wilkerson lived in, uh, he was born in some, I think somewhere, he was born somewhere, but... <laughs> He was raised in Pennsylvania. He didn't know anything else besides his little pretty little neighborhood. He would come home every evening and he would watch a wholesome TV show. That was his evening routine. He'd come home from work and then he'd watch a TV show. And the Lord spoke to him and said this, if you'll give me your TV time, I'll use you. So what did he do? He threw out his TV. That was a man of extreme measures. He threw out his TV. It sounds more like my wife. Her, you should hear her conversation. Sam, do you want me to take the hammer to the, you know, do we need to go ahead and break the TVs, break the DVD players? It's like, it's, calm down, Alina. <laughs> hey, but it might be needed. It might be time. Thankfully, we have a power button. 
cut the cord, get some scissors and just cut the power cord. Just unplug it. <laughs> Flip the breaker. <laughs> just all the power off the house. Light some candles, get some furnaces. Uh -huh. Collect some rocks outside. Let's do it the real way, right? We don't need all these things. No, but they're, they're blessings. Hallelujah. Where were we? Y'all got me off. <laughs> yeah, we were in Leviticus. Then we're going to go back to Kings. So the fire is always supposed to be upon the altar. Okay. There's got to be fire burning. But let's keep going for the sake of time. And it came to pass, verse 36, at the time of the evening offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, Lord, God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel and I am your servant and that I have done these things at your word. Hear me, O Lord, hear me, that this people may know that you are the Lord God and that you have turned their hearts back to you again. Amen. What is he doing? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of covenant, the God whose word never falls to the ground. Some of you need to go back to the promises that he's prophesied over your life. Go back to the prayers that you used to pray. Go back to the altar that you once built. Listen, I, Holy Ghost already told me yesterday morning, he said, you've rebuilt your altar. What did I do? I went back to revival. Mm -hmm. That's my altar. Mm -hmm. That's my zone what's your altar and if you don't know what it is find it find it but if you know what it is go back and do what you did before rebuild that altar rebuild the covenant of god can we break it down just one more step what created what did the spiritual create the physical or did the physical create the spiritual exactly are there physical pleasures? Sure. Yes. This church loves ginger ale. And if you don't drink ginger ale, I promise you, you come to Faith Harvest, you're going to be converted to ginger ale. <laughs> right, Tony? That's right. But there are pleasures, right? That's just a little level, but there are pleasures of this world. That's why the world doesn't want to give up their pleasures and come to Christ. But if there are physical pleasures, that means there must be spiritual pleasures, right? There's the scriptures that talk about in your presence, there's pleasures forevermore. So let's break it down. If the spiritual is greater than the natural, if the spiritual made the natural and there's pleasures in the spiritual and there's pleasures in the natural, then the spiritual pleasures are greater than the natural pleasures. But there's a cost to get it. There's a cost. You know, when little Lemmy over here, he wants Chick-fil-A. He gets in his car. I got to use him. He drives the Chick-fil-A, you know, go-kart going, everything, because you're too young. He gets in his go-kart. He goes to Chick-fil-A. He comes back. It cost him something. What did it cost him? Time. It cost him time. But to him, that stuff was better. That taste, that pleasure was worth the cost. We got to get to the place where the spiritual things. I remember one day, there was one day, I remember Michael came to me. He said, Sam, you're too busy. I said, yeah, I know. You don't have to tell me. He said, no, you're too busy. He's like, I'm your friend. I ain't trying to rebuke you. I was like, you can do whatever you want. You ain't ever going to offend me. He said, you're too busy. You got to learn how to say no. And I said, I know. He said, but it's not just saying no. You have to be okay with other people not being okay that you said no. He said, because people don't know, and this is for you too, what's on your life. People don't know what's on your life. People don't know what God's talking to you about. And if we just keep saying yes, 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 in the sake of good Christian culture. Now, there's times the Holy Ghost will give you the release. Go help. You know, there's an emergency. Go help. But there's always going to be stuff that's going to try to take your time. You got to learn how to say no to some things. Turn the TV off. Push a plate away. Get the people out of the house. Get alone. Yeah. Spend time with Him. Yeah. This is the great reality. This is what we need. We don't need more programs. We need fire. We don't need more entertainment. We need revival. Yeah. How does it start? It starts with your individual life. 
Leonard Ravenhill again said it, a great man of revival. He said that the church, the church doesn't have revival because it's not interested in it. He said, because there's no prayer. There's no prayer. God never discounts revival. It costs the same for every generation. Men must lay down their lives and pray. And I remember in my times, 18, 19 years old, when I was catching this flame of revival, that I began to just spend time in prayer. There's times the Holy Ghost would wake me up. There's times I would wake up myself. I didn't have really a schedule. When I felt Him, I went and prayed. And when I didn't feel Him, then I stuck to the schedule. And you just pray. It's, I'm not twisting His arm. I'm not asking Him, hurry, God, send something. I need something. I read stories about men seeing glory. I read stories about limbs growing back and bodies being raised. I mean, Smith Wigglesworth raising, what, 20-something plus people from the dead? There was a story where a man had no feet. He went to Smith Wigglesworth, got prayer. He, Smith Wigglesworth told him, go to the shoe store, pick the size you want, put your nubs in the shoes. The moment he put his nubs in the shoes, his feet filled out and formed into the shoes. When's the last time we've heard that? Smith Wigglesworth wouldn't let a newspaper into his house. If it wasn't the scripture, it didn't enter. Lester Summerall, Lester Summerall, Listen, Lester Summerall would walk into buildings and churches and demons would cry out because of the level of authority and dominion he was walking in. When's the last time a demon screamed because you walked into a room? I'm not talking about a demon that could be in you. I'm talking about the <laughs> demon. <laughs> hey, we know a, de a, spirit, a Christian can't be possessed, but he can be oppressed. You, ape, you open gateways and doorways. There ain't nothing. The, the world's out there. You can see it all over internet, entertainment. Every movie nowadays is shifting, is shifting, is shifting. There's gonna, uh, one minister said there's going to come a day where a Christian can't turn on a TV because of the onslaught of what the world's giving. Hallelujah. Let's keep going. So we know he washed it with water. Again, what did they do to the sacrifice? You're the sacrifice you got to put yourself on that altar every day. What did Jesus say? No man can follow me lest he give up himself, deny himself, take up his cross. you got to die daily. Not my will, Lord, but yours be done. Don't let me speak today out of frustration. Let me speak with the grace that you supply. Don't let me be overcome by agitations. Let me walk in your peace. And sometimes it's these little things. And one thing I've found is if you only push God into the secret place, you're going to get very frustrated because the only way you're going to experience him is in the secret place. You got to set up a secret place, but he's not in the secret place. He's in you. So wherever you go, he goes. So we have to learn how to have a habitual communion with the Lord that we establish in the secret place on this altar. But we carry that with us throughout the day until we return back to that place. I've had a time cutting down a tree in my house, in my yard. I'm weeping because I can feel the presence of the Lord, but I, I'm, I know I'm doing what I'm supposed to. I'm cutting my tree over here. It's tears coming down. The neighbors probably think I'm crazy. I'm not crying for the tree. <laughs> it was his closeness. I could hear the whispers of his love. I remember there was a time in my office, he whispered and said, let us exchange vows. When's the last time you exchanged a vow with Jesus? Declaring your love to Him. Declaring your, your pursuit of Him. This is personal revival. It starts with death. You're the sacrifice. But then He says this, and He poured water on it. What is that symbolizing? What did we say in the beginning of Ephesians? Washed by the water of the Word. That one time, two times, three times, they poured water on this sacrifice. you got to wash yourself with this. You got to wash yourself with this. And not just the New Testament. The New Testament is what we need, trust me. We're a New Testament church. We got to know what Paul spoke on. But did you know, I just lost my place in Ephesians, Kings, but I'll get there eventually. It'll open up. But did you know when Jesus, there we go. Do we know when Jesus quoted the scripture, he never quoted a New Testament verse? Every time he said the scripture says, the scripture says it was Old Testament. When he was on the road to Emmaus, it says, From Moses and the law to all the prophets, he showed everything that he was in. 
He revealed himself in the scriptures, which means the Old Testament is full of Jesus. Leviticus chapter uh, one or something where it talks about the burnt offering. That's the depiction of Jesus. Your altar is made of stone. Golgotha, a stone. Wood goes upon the altar. A cross is made of what? Wood. A spotless bull, ram, or goat must be sacrificed. The spotless lamb of God. Blood has to be sprinkled upon the altar. His blood poured out. The fire falls. The wrath of God, the consuming fire, fell upon Jesus as he spent that time in hell. Atonement was given. The eternal atonement. He's in the scriptures. You just got to find him. Here we go. Verse 37. We said it. Hear me, hear me. Verse 38. Then the fire of God fell, consumed the sacrifice, the wood, the stones, and the dust, licked up all the water. And when the people saw it, they fell upon their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. The altar was built. The covenant was remembered. The promises were reenacted. The cost was laid out. The sacrifice was presented. And then the fire fell. The fire wants to fall on you. The fire wants to consume you. They said of John Wesley, he said, The Lord has lit me on fire and the people come watch me burn. He's just a burning man. Filled with the fire of God. That's what we need. We don't need pretty presentations. We don't need the modern Christianity. We need the fire back. And the fire only falls on an altar. If your fire is out, it's either your, there is no altar or your altar has been broken. Rebuild it. Rebuild the altar. And then it says this, And they said to him, Seize the prophets of Baal and do not let them escape. So they seize them for the sake of time. I'm going to paraphrase. Basically, he takes them down to the brook and he kills all 800. Elijah, with the sword, kills 800 of the prophets. What is he doing? He's crucifying everything that was a contaminant to the nation of Israel. You want true revival? Pastor has a book. It's called The Sword of Revival. It talks about all the stuff revival brings. That is not just the oohs and the ahs and the glory. He's talking about the sword of revival, that there's some things that have to be cut out of your life. God, pastor said it. He said, there's going to be a demand for change. Are you going to count the cost for change? There's a sword that's coming, church. Are we going to prepare ourselves for that day to where we're willing to lay anything down? Anything down. Anything down. For His glory, for His fire, for His presence. Here's the last part. Then Elijah said to Ahab, Go up and eat and drink, for there's the sound of the abundance of rain. What caused the rain to fall? What fell before rain? Fire. We will not have corporate rain until the personal altars of our lives are restored and there is fire on the altar. A minister said this. He said, we cry out for God to show up publicly, but we don't show up for Him privately. What a disgrace. Lord, help me in my meeting. Help me in my interview. Help me, Lord, with this family. Help me, Lord, with prayer or worship or preaching. Help me, Lord. There's no altar. And then we get back to Sunday. Oh, it's already here again. And we got to get our spiritual facade on our spiritual boots on listen i I made it a habit because i understand there's times where weeks get busy but we can't afford to allow the busyness of life to overwhelm us to where we aren't seeking him fully i promise you i promise you this you'll be a better person if you seek him with everything when you abandon it all and pursue him with such hunger and such fire that's why me and michael got along so well in 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 college just because we had a similar pursuit the way we talked it was there was something different there was a, a kindred spirit of oh you want that well i want that and then oh you've been praying for that well i want that it's like there's this pursuit where you edge each other on there's there has to be a pursuit 
It should never be a time where we walk through that threshold of that front door and we have not prayed before coming in. There should never be a time where we have not spent time with the Lord preparing ourselves for coming in. So Elijah says there's the sound of the abundance of rain. And what did he tell Ahab to do? Go eat and drink. That's what the people who just want to play church, the fire comes on a Sunday, go eat and drink. Just, just go back to normal. But what did Elijah do? Elijah was a man who wanted revival. He was a man who wanted the presence of God. And he said this, But Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he bowed down on the ground and put his face between his knees. And he said to his servant, Go up now, look at the sea. So he went and looked and said, There's nothing. So seven times he said, Go again. And then it came to pass the seventh time he said, There is a cloud as small as a man's hand rising out of the sea. And so he said, Go up and say to Ahab, Prepare your chariot and go down before the rain stops you. If you want revival, revival, personal revival, personal fire, personal, tr the treasures of heaven being bestowed upon your life. The store, listen, John Knox lived in the uh, early, coming out of the dark ages of Europe. And it was when Spain and England were kind of in a battle. Listen to what one of the kings of Spain said about John Knox. He said, I'd rather have 10,000 men against me than face the prayers of John Knox. I'd rather have 10,000 soldiers come up against me than have to go up against that man's prayers. John Knox said, Lord, give me Scotland lest I die. And a revival fire blew through Scotland. Where are these prayers? Evan Roberts, a young man, ushered in the Welsh revival. He had a thing where he was seeking and praying the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And at 2 a.m., 1 a.m., the Lord woke him up and he had face-to-face -face encounters with Jesus for four hours and then he'd go back to sleep at five and sleep till nine. And for months, the Lord would visit him for these times. And he got into a meeting and he said it was like the coursing power of God overwhelmed him from that point on. And the revival began to just be birthed through the Welsh revival. And the Welsh revival is actually what start, sparked the fire to start Azusa Street revival. The Hebrides revival, these women were just praying. I promise you this, when we get to heaven one day, the front row for the, the, the most awards, it's not going to be the big preachers. It's going to be those people who just devoted themselves to pray and pray in and pray in and pray. And those ministers who are, I, already, I know some names, the, I know some people who've been praying for me. And everything that this my life accomplishes, I know they're going to receive the reward as well. This is, that's why he said building life together. You may not be in the forefront, but you have a part to play. And, and listen, the greatest treasure is the labor and prayer. But it's, the, it's one of the hardest things to do, but it's one of the most rewarding. You, you tap into one well in prayer, you're addicted. I could probably call many of you up and say, do you remember the times where you've prayed and you've hit it? You've, you've hit the gusher and your heart cries out, I just want to get back to that place. So as the rain begins to come, verse 45, Now it happened in the meantime that the sky became black with clouds and wind, and there was heavy rain. So Ahab rode away to Jezreel. Then the hand of the Lord came upon Elijah, and he girded up his loins and ran ahead of Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. So rains come. It's raining. Zechariah 10.1 says, In the time of rain, ask for rain. That word ask means crave, desire, hunger. It doesn't just fall. Church, it's raining. We're in the dispensation of rain. We're in the dispensation of movements of God. Nothing's holding back His glory. Nothing's holding back His fire. Nothing's holding back. And you, what we do is we come to church and we're supposed to absorb this, this taste of heaven and and then we take it into the world and let it influence wherever we go. You want to know what marked a lot of these revivalists? They had a hunger for the lost. They had a hunger for those who weren't saved. 
when Charles Finney came, said 80% of the people who got saved in his meetings never backslid. They never went back into the world. 80% of hundreds, almost close to millions of people converting. They said towns, the alcohol would shut down. The partying would shut down. Everything would shut down. All you'd hear is rejoicing and singing in the streets. Can you imagine that? To where every bar in Savannah is no longer open because nobody wants to drink and the churches are full and the streets are filled with the praises of God to where people aren't scared to have to go downtown to River Street at night, but you can go downtown to River Street and hear the worship and the, 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 the witnessing and the prayer. They said you could hear it in every corner, houses praying, 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 people being filled with the Spirit. Do it again, Lord. Do it again, Lord. So we see this thing that as the rain falls, an anointing comes upon Elijah, to where he outruns the king's chariot. He beats Ahab to Jezreel. When we rebuild the altar of your life, and when you allow the fire, listen, the fire of God, it doesn't just cause you to become passionate. It begins to burn out everything that's a hindrance. When that happens, the rain is going to fall. And when the rain falls, we're going to be ushered into an acceleration like never before. And we're going to see things. Let's go to 1 Peter and let me close. Glory, glory, glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Church, we got to up the prayer. We got to up the prayer. I remember, I remember times where we used to have services off of Fairmont. We've had some great services here too. Times in Fairmont where even the service is over, we're just still weeping. Just, just the, the hunger, the, the excitement, the pursuit. We got to get the pursuit back. Time's too short. Time's too short. For me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. One minister said this is revival or bust. There is nothing else. I mean, this is the goal. This is the aim. I mean, this is a life laid down. We're living for eternity. We're not living for this world. Where you can, you can remember what He's done, but you press for what He's doing. You got to press for what He's doing. But in 1 Peter, listen up, because we know with Elijah, it was this amazing moment, but the very next chapter, he gets seduced and just messed up by Jezebel, and then he runs off, and it's like his ministry is done. But I want to listen, the wording, it says, he girded up the loins, which means he began to tie his robe around him so he could run faster. In 1 Peter chapter 13, it says this, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind and be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus. The reason why Elijah didn't finish well is because he didn't, even though he girded up the loins in his body, he didn't gird the loins up in his mind. He didn't protect his mind because when Jezebel spoke, it says when he saw not heard, saw. So it was something in the mind that attached itself to him. Pastor said, there's a liberty that wants to break forth, but it can't break forth until there's a new mind for the new man. Where do you get a new mind? Do you renew your mind according to the Word of God? That's why I said it's easy. It's not, it's, it's not easy, it's simple. Die to self, absorb the Scriptures, pray. You devote your life to those three things and God will use you. And He will send you wherever He needs to send you. And He will move through you however He needs to. And it sounds boring. And on the flesh, it is extremely boring. But when your spirit tastes heaven, whatever your flesh could taste pales in comparison. Are you hungry? Did you know God's not in charge of your hunger? You're hungry. You're, you're as close to God as you want to be. Just look at your lifestyle. It tells you how close you want to be. We're as hungry as we want to be. Because when you're fasting, when you've tucked the TV off, when you've silenced the phone, when you've set yourself to start reading more and praying more, you realize something begins to happen.
something begins to stir. Something begins to be reborn and rekindled and re put re aflame. And you realize you're hungry. You're hungry. Why? It's not because God blessed you with a greater grace. It's because you began to limit what was grabbing your attention and you began to fill yourself with the pure river. They said in the book of Jeremiah, my people have committed two sins. They have forsaken me, the fountain of life. And they have built for themselves empty vessels, empty cisterns. We can't forsake him. But, he, but right here, this mind, we got to renew it according to the word of God. Watch your tendencies. And I'm closing. Watch your tendencies. It's, it's the little things. Like when you go to sit on the couch and you get on your phone, what do you normally go to? What do you normally scroll on? They're not saying sinful things. And could you replace that time with just reading scripture? Could you put on the Bible app instead of social media? I told my wife, because I had a habit where I'd get on Facebook and I'd just scroll. And I got ministers and stuff on my Facebook, so I see some Jesus stuff. I unfollow the people who do crazy stuff because I don't want nothing on there that I don't want to see. But I told my wife, go ahead, change the password and don't tell me what it is. There ain't nothing on there I need to see. And you go to, you know, you're out of habit. You click, you know, this and then you go there and you're like, oh, password. Okay, that's right. I'm taking a break. So let me, let me go ahead and open up my Bible app. And you start doing little things like that. And I promise you it's going to help. You start setting tendencies for yourself. You start making a time. Okay, let me not watch TV or, or whatever you do during the week, maybe only Friday night. And start devoting yourself to this. Be filled with the word. Be filled with the spirit. Be filled with prayer. And realize it says, at the revelation of Jesus. At the revelation of Jesus. Go ahead, stand to your feet. Glory, 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 glory. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Whew. Glory to God. This year, we're going to make sure this year is a year for the better. We're going to make sure we hit pockets of glory this year. I'm telling you, there's wells of His presence, wells of breakthrough that are waiting for someone to just to stir the waters. Make it your aim to be one of those stirrers. Make it your aim to be one of those pursuers. I don't care how old you are. Make it your aim. Josiah was like eight years old or 10 years old when he became king. But it said he, he opened up the law and began to give back the people the commandments of the Lord. And he destroyed the high places and broke down the altars. As a young boy, he began to pursue God. Age. Listen, God doesn't care about age. He cares about hunger and pursuit. Does he have your yes? And it's a lot easier to say yes now than when it is at home. When the work life and the schedule comes back on and his, his, his spirit is screaming, give me your yes. And now you're weighing in the balances, the things that are part of your routine. Do I give that up in order to say yes to him? That's where we find the ones who want it versus the ones who are okay without it. And we have to get to a place to where his presence becomes our very breath where we cannot survive without the breath of His presence and the food of His Word. To where we get back to biblical Christianity. To where we are ablaze. Faith Harvest should be a household name in Savannah because of a people who pray. Of a people who are on fire. Leonard Ravenhill said this, Your church doesn't need any marketing and brochures and announcements into the world. He said, fire attracts. And if your church is on fire, people will come. Let's make it our aim to individually be on fire and corporately fuel each other into greater fire. Let's pray. Father, we thank you today, Lord God. We give you glory and honor. We thank you, Holy Spirit. Let us get back to the burning.
to the burning. You said it, you're, you have a spirit. It's called the spirit of burning. Lord, I'm not asking for a casual Christianity. And Lord, I'm not asking, Lord, for just a normal American culture to Christianity. But Father, I'm asking that right now you would begin to pull upon the hearts of your people to get back to what a biblical Christianity looks like. Lord, if the altars of prayer have begun to wane and that fire is low and that altar is broken, Lord, I pray that you would begin to impregnate your people this morning with a burden and a desire to begin to pray again, to begin to intercede again, to begin to travail. You said in your word that when Zion travails, Lord God, let there be a travailing that begins to sweep through this ministry again, Father God. Lord, let us take you serious. Lord, from the youngest to the oldest, let there be a burning passion and desire. Lord, their heart may not burn for revival, but Lord, let their heart burn for you. And whatever sphere of influence, Lord God, in whatever area you've called them to. But Father, I pray that we would become that chaste wife, that bride who is glorious and spotless, without wrinkle and without the things of this world contaminating her. So Lord, I pray, let your bride arise this morning in this place, Lord God. Let there be a determination. Let there be a hunger. Let there be a pursuit like's never been before. Lord, if they call us crazy, who cares? Lord, if they say that we're too spiritual, who cares? Lord, I pray this morning that there would be such desire that begins to flow in this place. Lord, that we would not recognize one another, that we would not just see each other in the natural, but there would be a force and a wind that carries us through this year into this next level, that this would be a safe haven for your glory and your presence, Lord. We pray it this morning, Lord God. Hearken unto the prayers of your people. Remind them of your covenant, Lord God. Lord, help them to rebuild the altar of their life, where they seek you with reckless abandon, where they seek you, Lord, where they don't care what it costs them, as long as they get heaven. If they gain heaven, Lord God, they've gained everything. And so, Lord, I'm praying this morning that you would baptize your people afresh with fresh fire, Lord, with fresh baptisms of the Holy Ghost. Oh, Lord. Lord, I'm praying. Lord, let us get back to the days of old where people got baptized in the Holy Ghost for real. Lord, where there was physical, evident change in their, their life, Lord God. Lord, it wasn't just about getting tongues. It was about the immersion, the submersion of the Holy Spirit where there was a full sacrifice and a full surrender. Lord, I pray you would cause them to burn on their beds again with holy fire and anticipation for what you're doing. Lord, and every sin that so easily ensnares them, Lord, just burn it out with your fire. Lord, burn it out with your desire. Burn it out, Lord, with your holiness. Lord, get us back to holiness. Lord, let that be the cry of our heart. Holiness. Holiness is what I long for. It's what I desire. Lord, that we would live a separated life. You've called us out of darkness and brought us into your marvelous light. Lord, you did not come to make bad men good you came to make dead men live. And so, Father, I thank you that there is life and life abundant waiting for them to catch and grasp it. So this morning, I pray, Lord, that you would begin to put a desire in them to go after eternal life with everything. Lord, that th that life would begin to live itself in them and through them. That family members would no longer be able to be contained and be able to resist the moving of the Holy Ghost. Glory to God. 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 Hallelujah. There was a story of John G. Lake, and he st told a story of a man who was seeking the baptism of the Holy Ghost, and he was tarrying underneath the tree, and he had a loved one who was not saved, who did not accept Jesus because they felt like there wasn't enough fruit in their spouse's life. And so therefore they rejected it, but this man waited and tarried, and he finally was filled with the Spirit of God. And he ran inside the house, and the moment his wife saw him, she fell to her knees and surrendered to Jesus. She saw a difference. She saw a change. She saw something on 
upon him to where she said, you have what I need. And she gave her life to the Lord. And he went to every governmental office in his town. And the moment he walked into the room, the men in those chairs slid out of their chairs, crawled underneath the desk and cried out for mercy because the presence of the Lord was upon him. He was not an educated man. He was not a man who'd been called of God to any pulpit ministry. He just wanted the baptism of the Holy Ghost. And I pr I'm telling you today that for some of you, if you have a spouse who's not saved, it's not through your words. It's going to be through the conduct and the flame of the Holy Ghost that the atmosphere of your home can change and that loved one will come to Christ. In the name of Jesus, to whoever that was for, just take that right now. In the name of Jesus, 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 glory to God, glory to God, glory to God. Oh, we thank you for fresh fire. We thank you for fresh fire. We thank you, Lord, for baptizing this church in fire. Lord, baptizing your church, this church in fire, baptizing this church in fire, making us flames of the gospel, ministering flames of the spirit. In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus, glory, 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 glory. Madrina, I just keep seeing you on your bed burning like you used to. Burning, burn, burn, burn again, burn again, burning for him, burning, burning, glory. Glory. You're not too busy. So there was one man who said, I must be in his presence for two hours every morning to be able to get done in the day what I have need of. His presence is everything. His presence is everything, church. His pr we should come into this church from now on with this place electric, with the presence of God, because the prayers of the saints have gone forth. There is mighty, dynamic, dynamite power at the fervent prayer of a righteous man or woman. Glory to God. Glory to God. Glory to God. Our homes should be the atmosphere of heaven. Should be the atmosphere of heaven. To where the Word and the Spirit are just teeming in life at home. Glory to God. Glory. Lord, I pray for every one of us a fresh surrender to seek you with everything we have. And Lord, that you would set us on fire and let the world watch us burn with holy desire. In the name.